Omega's Mystic Defender on Genesis, circa 1989, based on Makoto Gino's Peacock King, or Kujakuo, hence its Japanese counterpart, Kujakuo 2, a direct sequel to Spellcaster for the Master System, also based on Peacock King, aka Kujakuo. If he's watching this, Jules Carosa, this is for you. As usual, before we get into this latest review, I'm dedicating this to Brooklyn Interactive Group, Somerville Media Center, JMC Facepalm Doherty, Battle Mode Music, made up of Biff and Astro, of course, Danny Pryor, aka Diamond Machine, Alana Gordon, Tess Amoroso from Beverly, Nerd Caliber, Anime Boston, Magfest, Pax East, Bit Bar Salem, The Crypt, Darman Studios, Jay Shetty, Fit Chronicles, Illumably, ETU Animated Stories, YouTubers Real Sabia, John Tommy, and the Lazy D1, and finally, if she's watching this, Daisy Alicia from Waltham. With these out of the way, on to our main premise. It's set in an alternate Japanese fantasy dimension, within which a religiously obsessed anarchistic sorcerer slash warlord by the name of Zareth, originally Oda Nobunaga in the manga and the OAV series, who's managed to kidnap Alexandra, the daughter of a supreme deity, originally Ashura aka Regina and Spellcaster, so her spirit can be used as a sacrifice for the resurrection of a dreaded ancient god, King Zhao, originally the Holy Cherubim, within the confines of their quote-unquote rightfully claimed and resurfaced from submersion Azuchi Castle, this would all seem bleak as fuck and lost beyond imagination, as Strong World's newly recruited veteran sorcerer-slash-fighter, Jo Yamato, originally Kujaku from the manga and OVAs, hence their main protagonist, and Kanan Spellcaster, is out to not only thwart the ambitions of the dark-hearted Zareth, his demonic god Zhao, and their many full disciples, but to ultimately save Alexandra from their goddamn thirsty-ass clutches. Gameplay-wise, who'd expect anything less than yet another intense-as-fuck action platformer? Here, you're in control of Joe, aka Kujaku, or Kane, as he traverses from one cursed and ravaged area to another, with some alternate dimensional voids mixed in, no less, while exterminating the jizz out of every otherworldly being, creature, and apparition, and advancing his spiritual sorcery abilities along the way. In terms of control, the D-pad lets Joe haul ass wherever, and duck when necessary, and by default, A allows him to swap his incantations, B to summon said incantations both at normal power and at full maximum power, the latter of which occurs by holding down and releasing B, hence the meter at the top, a Kent's Irem's R-type series, and C to jump individually, though all buttons can be swapped around beforehand in the option screen before starting. Regarding the types of magic incantations he's capable of invoking, the Psycho Magic is Joe's or Kujaku's introductory means of attack, where single energy orbs are fired off at normal power, and three slightly larger variations are summoned all at once at maximum, until earning and acquiring the following special incantations upon making every area boss his bottom bitch. Flame Magic, a field of fire surrounds Joe, while another stream of flames appears in front of him upon charging and releasing. Sonic Magic, six high-velocity sparks are instantly summoned at maximum power upon charging and releasing, as they zigzag and tilt around the stage areas at random. And, of course, the most extraordinary incantation of all, the Thunder Dragon Magic, which is more than just a kick-ass screen nuke that summons three dragons, like those seen on the cover and label, unleashing their shockingly fiery rage upon every adversary within Joe's range, and thereby torching every demonic douchebag to shit all. But despite being a one-use item, it can be reacquired at later intervals, in which case, save them only for the end-boss confrontations. <laughs> Other than those, the blue and red icons you encounter regain Joe's life force by a single unit and enhances his spiritual sorcery power beyond leaps and bounds individually. The life meter at the bottom left, akin to those from Altered Beast and Golden Axe, Cus Saga, decreases every time Joe takes damage. Therefore, he is totally fucked beyond thoughts and words if that last unit disappears. Itinerary-wise, there's eight areas in total. You start off in a forest monastery, rife with cursed zombie priest sorcerers, snakes that crawl up and down trees, and mini dragons, followed by a skeletal chameleon, along with the first of mini giant worms, and a hulking mutant kaiju douchebag. 
a towering temple at night shrouded in fog, featuring the return of those same zombie priests, except colored differently, and is capable of transforming into bizarre-looking turquoise heads. And hell, even these same heads appear by themselves, not to mention moths and infants made of slime, followed by a cult of masked and robed dark monks that randomly teleport, fire off green shurikens, and transform into spiders upon their demise. Through two different underground caves and biomechanical catacombs, inhabited by alien fortified barriers, fire-breathing statues, moving platforms, barriers with skulls emanating from them, and swarms of amoebae, floating diamonds that summon laser rings, and puking giant worms rising from the golden lava pool, leading up to Azuchi Castle, specifically its inner sanctum with nothing more than those very same spider-transforming, masked and rubbed dark monks from earlier, under the leadership of whom I imagine is Organtino, one of Nobunaga's aka Zerath's henchmen, who appears in two giant segmented worm forms no less. <coughs> Another pout swaps biomechanical catacombs area, with even more flame traps up the ass, and the return of those infuriating as fuck skull barriers. And lastly, the main throne, where those same masked and robed dark priests make their return once more, and even the same orbs that pop up and float around by themselves, firing off random beams, complete with teleporting two platforms, spirit cannons, giant bomb hurling claws, followed by the eventual long awaited confrontations against Zareth, aka Nobunaga, and King Zhao, aka the Holy Cherubim, complete with a fuck ton of ghastly, sperm like blobs and flashing purple orbs, while Alexandra, aka Ashura, suffers silently atop that monstrous organic pissant, either in the nude, as seen here, or with address that is in alternate versions for the sake of censorship policies in the US and or other countries. Going hand in hand with the overall difficulty and strength these trials and tribulations in these levels are bound to bring about, rivaling even Ninja Gaiden and Hagane might I add, at least a fraction of all the bosses you'll encounter will jerk you off all over the place and then mutilate your senses worse than all the virtual prostitutes from Grand Theft Auto V and Road to Retribution combined. I mean seriously, razor sharp senses, balls harder than diamonds, and the fictional Lydium 90 from the Ninja Turtles episode April Foolish, and even the most undeniably keen timing are mandatory for surviving everything, and I do mean every mother goddamn fucking thing Mystic Defender will throw your way, hence where the next usual subject comes in. As awkward, askew, and astronomically discombobulated, not to mention baffling as bombs as the controls are at first. After a while, it doesn't take very much or too long for them to sink in whatsoever, nor does the rudimentary gameplay procedure. Need the Christ I say more for fuck's sake? Regarding Mystic Defender's challenge, once more, as is the case with every Tough as Nails action platformer, regardless of which era they hail from, an immense deal of trial and error is strictly advised. Likewise for the most stalwart mindset and strategic know-how fused into one that anyone could possibly muster up. At least the first two areas are a milk run, in spite of how nauseating and redundant the efforts are of nailing the tight jumps between the long-ass gaps every time you miss by a long shot. And while we're at it, the flame traps in Areas 3 and 6 can be a real gang of bastards, ditto for the falling pillars in Area 4 within the instant death acid and or lava pits, especially when going up against those earlier recounted puking giant worms. Also, speaking of which, getting back to the boss confrontations, and consider this my final reiteration ever, if you're not watchful enough against those supernatural, brooding, dick-squashing, granted-ass motherfuckers, they'll make your life an eternal living hell that even Satan, Saddam, Bin Laden, Lee Harvey Oswald, Manson, Bundy, Dahmer, Gacy, and every long-since-deceased, heartless-as-fuck soul, god forbid on all of them, would envy them and everything this game will throw at you faster than 10 million fucking poison darts descending from on high. Starting out, you're provided with 3 lives on Normal Mode, 4 on Easy Mode Type 1, and or 5 on Easy Mode Type 2. I therefore rely on nothing else than my own stroke of luck and wit to endure and conquer every unexpected hurdle throughout, and above all, don't become too discouraged regardless of how goddamn severe they are, let alone turn out to be. Graphically, for yet another early, albeit criminally overlooked, Genesis title, again from the same time frame as these titles listed here, the majority of every presentation aspect is nothing short of decent, albeit a trifle decrepit. Joe, once again, aka Kujaku or Kane, by himself is well represented, despite the obvious costume change between the original versions, not just in game, but also during the iconic opening sequence shown not only at the beginning, but also in between every stage. The supporting characters, however few of them there are, and specifically, yes, Alexandra, aka Sure Accounts, and please refer to what I discussed earlier about the censorship parameters regarding her depiction at the end of the game, and the vast majority of opposing characters alike are anything but a plethora of mind-numbing eyesores in all bluntness, not just the main antagonists themselves, namely King Zhao aka the Holy Cherubim, Zareth aka Nobunaga, 
Argentino and his Jesuit messengers, etc., but also all the other minor adversaries, whether from the manga and OVAs, or introduced especially for this game iteration alone, stay structure-wise, while the everyday, near-realistic, natural, and medieval fantasy backgrounds are there for the sake of introducing us to what we're about to expect, there are also some serious biomechanic and underground fantasy settings to balance out the journey, with the penultimate indicated setting types, specifically Areas 3 and 6, and their gory-ass, horror-inspired features being reminiscent of the late, great H.R. Geiger. Huh, if only the Queen had a cameo appearance somewhere. Yeah, whatever, get the fuck away from us, you bitch! Apart from everything else, the differentiating effects of Joe's or Kujaku's sorcery tactics kick far too much ass, rivaling even the likes of ILM and Digital Domain combined. In terms of music and sound, composed and arranged by Chikako Kamatani, acting under the alias Tarnia, of Alex Kidd in The Enchanted Castle, Fantasy Star 2, G-Lock Air Battle, Eswat on Master System, Game Ground and Pyramid Magic fame, also, fun fact, she's the lawfully wedded wife of another veteran Sega composer, Kazuhiko Nav Nagai of Altered Beast fame. While well, I've been hearing time and time again how forgettable and less than satisfying the soundtrack is, I am unapologetically going on record pointing out the antithesis here, which I won't even bother to take back or stand down on, even if my ass depended on it. There appears to be this atmospheric, otherworldly vibe going on with every supporting theme, notwithstanding the fact that at least nearly half of them happen to stake out like an anteater's boner more than anything. I mean, what the fuck? But in full irreversible honesty, the songs are far from grating. What is grating, in fact, are the participating slew of sound effects, especially when Joe summons his different sorcery abilities, regardless of what he uses and even the ongoing demises of every enemy. In addition, I've been optimistic about everything up until now, but this constant as hell praising habit of mine strictly ends here. And before I go any further, take note of my top 6 songs displayed here, with a few honorable mentions provided below. Replayability-wise, while there isn't much to go apeshit or salivate over, even after more than three decades, might I add, and considering how short this particular game is, not counting that long-ass final boss battle against King Zhao, aka the Cherubim, in juxtaposition with the occasional frustration that arises during the most intense moments, with a substantial deal of diligence and an indisputably intrepid mentality, it's no question that you'll make every effort to overthrow the almost insurmountable supernatural challenges of Joe Yamato, the Mystic Defender. Therefore, what's my final verdict so far? It should be obvious why this game never had the notoriety and recognition that other Genesis titles at the time did. In fact, according to Hardcore Gaming 101, whether it was the licensing issues regarding its Japanese counterparts release, or the plain fact that it was just criminally overlooked, is way beyond all of us, even yours truly. Either way, if you're on the market for an extraordinarily grandiose 16-bit adventure unlike any other, even bordering on Supernatural, and putting even Bandai Namco's Splatterhouse franchise to a contempt far beyond recall, I cannot, cannot recommend Mystic Defender enough, let alone its Japanese counterpart Kujaku O2 or Peacock King 2, and even its Master System predecessor Spellcaster. So what are you waiting for? The next Chinese Lunar New Year celebration? Make every effort to hunt it down like a rare Mewtwo. No, even better, the legendary Lugia, Ho-Oh, Suicune, Raikou, and Entei. And let me assure you, under no circumstances whatsoever will you regret it in the slightest. Until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro Guide, triumphantly signing off.